welcome to our panel. Uh, we the, are talking about the science fiction continuum. Uh, and so if you spent your whole week in um, spaceflight reality, we're now going to uh, seg a little bit into some of the imaginative visions that have been powering those ideas um, and that we know that so many of us are fans of. Um, we have an enormous room uh, for this panel and uh, wonderful to see you here. I'm always curious about kind of who's in our audience, what are you reading, what are you watching, what are you thinking about um, when we're doing science fiction? So um, I'll do a quick show of hands and you don't have to only vote for one. Um, any Star Wars fans in the room? Okay, very good. Star Trek. Okay. Um, some of the older, going way back, older television, Space Patrol, Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, kind of, all right, very good, I see you. Um, literary science fiction is in uh, Isaac Asimov, uh, Ray Bradbury, Robert Heinlein, um, Octavia Butler, um, Ursula Le Guin, Double hands on some, okay. Um, I've just started uh, Neti Okorafor's uh, Binti series. Anybody else reading that with me? A Nigerian-American author who's written a, a Hugo Award-winning novella. Um, Black Panther as the film, as the comics. Okay. Um, recent space movies, anyone watch The Martian? Uh, Gravity? Interstellar, all right, the, this room is gonna be a lot of fun. Um, looking then, we've got uh, recent television. There's been a reboot of Lost in Space, a couple of seasons of that. Um, Star Trek Discovery, okay. Um, and then we've got stuff we haven't even gotten to see yet. Um, Picard, For All Mankind, coming out. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> People who are excited about the uh, the next generation, if you will, of some of these uh, properties and um, uh, uh, Ron Miller's reimagination of the space race. So we have a lot that we could talk about and we have a lot in common that we can really bring to this paper uh, and to this panel. So um, I'm delighted to have such a wonderful set of panelists to um, join us in this conversation. Um, and I always think it's more interesting when people introduce themselves versus having me read all of their stuff off of a card. So uh, first we have Ardula, who is with the Robert Heinlein Trust. Um, Art, do you have your mic? It should be right there with you. All right, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're here with us today. Well, I'm, uh, I'm an attorney from Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm a patent attorney, and I worked with Mr. Heinlein, and when he died in 1988, his widow, Virginia, wanted to form a trust, and uh, she asked me to do that, so I'm trustee of that trust. And also, I am uh, his literary administrator. I'm the administrator of his literary estate, so I sign all the new contracts. And Mr. Heinlein is still in print in 127 countries and 30 languages. And uh, I'll tell you more about Mr. Heinlein later. That sounds great. Um, Mikkel, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work at Lockheed Martin? Sure, so I'm here because I'm a nerd. And I am the offspring of science fiction, watching, comic book reading nerds. My parents are scientists. And I am a classically trained political scientist, so that was ha-ha on them. However, I have a great respect for science. I worked at the Department of Energy prior to this. Um, currently, I manage sustainability disclosures and reporting at Lockheed Martin, which means I factor in all of our sustainability work at the corporation and our progress. And I relate it to a variety of stakeholders, sustainability, includes for us things like energy and environment, which is very classic, to things like STEM education, product impact, cybersecurity, so it's a broad range. And I'm excited to be here today to nerd out with all of you. Excellent, we're delighted that you're here. So, uh, Sands, you're substituting in for, for your colleague and founder of the MIT Media Labs, Ariel Ekbal. Um, can you, uh, she was very sorry that she could not join us today. She had uh, a family issue uh, 
and wasn't able to be here, but wanted to really um, reiterate the commitment of the MIT Media Lab to um, participating in something like this. And we're delighted that you were able to uh, substitute in. Cause you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure, thank you. So uh, I just wanted to clarify that Ariel is the founder of the MIT Media Lab Space Exploration Initiative, uh, ah, not the very good. Media Thank Lab, um, but uh, not to take anything away from that. She's an incredible person, incredible leader, and um, and I'll talk a little bit today about uh, kind of what we do there. Um, I am a designer uh, there and a recovering computer scientist, um, and I basically got into this. Well, really early on, uh, I was a, like a 13-year-old Planetary Society member. I think it was the first thing I ever subscribed to in my life. And, um, and had this kind of early appreciation for sci-fi, um, but never knew how I might contribute to space um, until the Space Exploration Initiative started and there was an open call for uh, zero-gravity flights. Um, and so I got into this um, kind of from the angle of bringing art and design and culture. Uh, into space exploration, um, and we're of course not, uh, by far, not the only ones doing work in this space, but uh, I can talk a little bit today about uh, some of the experiments that we're doing there and how we're trying to you know, further the cultural exploration of space. And uh, we have a little video that we want to show in a minute, but it occurs to me that I never introduced myself. My name is Margaret Weidekamp. I'm the chair of the Space History Department at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Uh, there, in addition to being the head of department, I am a curator for our social and cultural dimensions of spaceflight collection, which means I work with our artifacts that are memorabilia of the actual space program, as well as with our science fiction objects, which are a few screen use props, but largely commercially available memorabilia. So everything from Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon back in the 1930s through to um, stuff that comes from uh, uh, Tom Corbett Space Cadet or Space Patrol, Star Trek, Star Wars, um, up to Babylon 5, some other uh, more recent things. We tend to have mostly things for television or movies because there just aren't a lot of Robert Heinlein action figures. Um, the literary side of the genre doesn't often end up as representative represented in things, and that is really uh, where I work. But so I'm thinking a lot about how spaceflight has been imagined um, and how spaceflight has been memorialized, and I see those two things as, as very connected. Um, and so this is a subject that is really near and dear to my heart. Um, but we have a video here for, that was created for the MIT Media Lab that um, is from another well-known figure in this field uh, talking about his connections to that. Can we play that now? Hi, it's JJ Abrams. Uh, welcome to the MIT Media Lab Space Initiative kickoff event. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but uh, I have been asked to say a few words, so here, here they are. Uh, I've been very lucky to get to work on films that have dealt with space travel. And uh, what's fascinating is that working on the movies We've, uh, for example, we shot some of uh, one of our Star Trek films at uh, the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore Labs. And almost to a scientist working there, they said that they got involved in their field because of Star Trek. And there we were actually shooting Star Trek. And the influence that, uh, that fantasy and science fiction has on us and then we on it is uh, an ongoing cycle. And I, I'm, I feel very lucky and privileged to get to be involved in, in any part of it. Um, I've been asked to challenge you to do all you can to ensure that actual space travel is possible, but I feel like that's inevitable. You're doing that work, and no matter what I say, it's, uh, it is written. Um, Doug Trumbull is there, uh, one of uh, my heroes in film technology, but also uh, visual effects, working on films like 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, I have a, a piece of paper at home. Uh, that says, uh, Dear JJ, movies are fun, and life can be fun making movies. I started making movies when I was 13. I hear you're doing great at 11. Keep it up. And it's signed, Doug Trumbull. My father got it for me when I was 11 years old. Um, one day, about four years ago, five years ago or so, I saw Doug Trumbull, and I told him about this piece of paper that I have. And his reaction was, oh. So, anyway. Uh, but. He's one of my heroes, uh, so I'm, I'm jealous that you're with him today. 
Uh, I wish you all the best uh, and have fun. Thanks. So obviously that was for a different event, um, but uh, certainly we don't I think actually have Doug Trumbull in a box. We don't have just, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, but I think that speaks to some of the spirit of how we uh, at the MIT Media Lab are approaching space exploration, um, very heavily influenced by science fiction, and I think there's there's a loop for us um, where we are trying to both be reading science fiction and becoming inspired, but then use that as inspiration to actually try and, and build some prototypes of our kind of sci-fi space future. Um, and so we are kind of heavily read in a lot of, of the things that were mentioned before and some maybe more obscure ones um, and use those as, as fodder for discussion and ways to kind of think both ethically and creatively and from an engineering standpoint. Uh, about all of uh, the things that we're building there. Um, maybe I'll describe a couple of uh, the things that we're doing at the, at the Space Exploration Initiative. Um, and they kind of range very broadly. Um, and of course, if, when you bring together uh, designers and artists and engineers, um, you get kind of a very broad palette of things. So we're working on everything from uh, kind of future, uh, prototypes for future space architecture, so these mega structures. Uh, that we've seen in sci-fi. Um, we're working on a very s small versions of those right now to kind of test them in zero gravity. Um, so Ariel Ekbla, who we mentioned uh, founded the Space Exploration Initiative, is working on a project called Tesseray, uh, which is essentially a number of, of panels that can kind of magnetize and demagnetize, and working on how those structures might self-assemble in space. Uh, for now, they're only about you know, four inches wide for each panel. Um, but we are doing uh, this kind of micro uh, architecture to <coughs> prove the concepts uh, and eventually to try and scale those up. Uh, for my work, I first um, entered into the, what I mentioned was the open call for a zero gravity flight when we started. Um, and my collaborator, Nicole Lehoulier, and I uh, were both musicians um, and both uh, really interested in uh, how we can kind of realize this kind of like sci-fi in our experiments. And so we built the, uh, this uh, electronic musical instrument to be performed specifically in microgravity. And uh, it, it actually won't work in under regular gravity. And the idea was like leave behind as much as possible uh, the conventions of, of things that you find on, on Earth. Um, and if you reflect on some of, there's been plenty of uh, musical instruments taking, taken up into space, of course. Um, but uh, if you think about the piano, for instance, if you take a piano to, uh, into microgravity, it won't actually work because the reason the keys return up after you press them is that there's a counterweight that will kind of bring them back up. And of course, there's no gravity to, to enact that. Um, and so we're learning a lot about how the kind of the lack of gravity uh, or sorry, the presence of gravity is actually built into a lot of things. We had some friends take a, a keyboard and just synthesizer up to kind of avoid that, that counterweight problem. And they went to turn a knob on it and the entire keyboard just turned around <laughs> in their hands. So we're for, through these experiments on zero gravity flights and we try and, and, and walk through a couple of different stages of doing zero gravity experiments uh, on these flights um, and then taking them into suborbital flights with Blue Origin. Uh, and then um, up into internal uh, International Space Station uh, experiments. Uh, we're trying to kind of walk these experiments forward and, and try and realize them as much as possible um, and taking those sci-fi concepts and placing them in, in the real environment. I think those connections between culture and spaceflight are so interesting. Uh, two of the objects for which I'm responsible are the um, miniature harmonica, it's only about an inch or so long, and the set of jingle bells uh, that were the first musical instruments in space that were brought um, on a Gemini flight by um, uh, Wally Shira and Tom Stafford, um, who played Jingle Bells um, just before Christmas time, but um, relied in, entirely on it had to be something that was you know small enough and light enough uh, that they could take it. But I always think the ways that we project ourselves into spaceflight, the way that that becomes uh, a part of the um, people's workplaces and people's culture, I think is uh, is really important. And then when we you know want to imagine ourselves kind of going forward um, into living in space. Now, Art, um, a lot of 
some of the really creative base ideas in space science fiction started with Heinlein. Well, uh, yes, Mr. Heinlein was born in 07, uh, and he graduated in 29 from the Naval Academy as a officer, and in 33 he was retired medically with TB, and he, he had to make a living in the middle of the Depression. So he became a uh, miner and a politician in California, and none of that worked. So he tried writing by about 1939. He couldn't publish his first book, nobody would publish it. He published his first story and then went on to be the most popular science fiction author or one of the most popular in the country along with Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. But in his stories, Margaret, he invented the waterbed. How many people here knew that Robert Heinlein invented the waterbed? He originally called it the water brother bed. And he did it because he was hospitalized a lot of time. He really got tired of being in a hospital bed, and so he invented a better bed. He also had a story called Waldo and Magic Incorporated, where we get the Waldos we use to handle radioactive isotopes, the artificial hands. And he invented the Heinlein Maneuver, which is a astrodynamics maneuver from the moon to the Earth, using the Earth as a slingshot to go out to the asteroid belt. So when we launch from the moon, we will use the Heinlein maneuver, which was described in one of his juvenile novels, The Rolling Stones. He also, just for those of you who like Star Trek, was the originator of what animal in Star Trek? Tribbles. The trouble with tribbles, yes. And, and he was delighted. He called them flat cats. And in that same Rolling Stones story, they multiplied like mad, same story, and he really loved that. But Heinlein's greatest achievement was, to, was social, not technical. He had strong African-American characters in his, as protagonists in his novels in the mid-1950s. He had women as pilots of the starships. He anticipated many of the social trends that we have in our world today, and it made him quite uncomfortable with his editors. And he actually left one publishing company because they wouldn't publish the uncut version of Starship Troopers, which is a story about duty. He's still in print all over the world, movies, TV shows, we have Stranger in a Strange Land coming out on the Science Fiction Channel. So a lot of influence and many, many people at this conference have come by and said to me, I read all of his stories as a little girl or a little boy, but I'll tell you more about what we do later. That sounds great. Uh, Mikkel, tell us a little bit about the, the connections that you see with science fiction and your work. Well, like I said, I'm a nerd. And my mom is the biggest Star Trek fan you have ever met. I have, when I was a little girl, I watched all of the original episodes, hence why I knew about the Tribbles. And when I grew older, I actually bought my mom a Tribble for her birthday. And one year, I bought her a life-size cutout of Spock, which scared us in the house, so we had to put it up. But, you know, in elementary school, I'm trying to talk to my classmates about the Prime Directive, and they're looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, how do you guys not know this? And so for me, it was just a natural part of growing up, plus reading the X-Men, ElfQuest, some of you may remember. If any of you remember Amethyst, Princess of Gin World, probably not, but that was a comic book as well. Uh, a lot of the old school Marvel comic books, a lot of the old school DC comic books, I had a strong appreciation for possibility. And I also really enjoyed reading Greek myths. And if you think about Greek myths as science fiction, not just mythology, um, the story that comes to mind is Icarus where his father, Daedalus, who was, Daedalus was the inventor of the labyrinth, and they were locked up by the king of Minos because they had invented the labyrinth to keep the Minotaur, which was to trap the Minotaur, and Daedalus had helped someone get through the labyrinth. So the king locked them up as punishment, so Daedalus, being an inventor, made wings from feathers and wax, and he told his son, do not get complacent and fly too low so that your wings get soggy from the ocean, and do not be filled with hubris so that your wings 
melt, the wax on your wings melt from the sun. And so when he and Icarus escaped, Icarus flew too close to the sun, his wings melted and he died. But think about how many people over the years have been trying to fly close to the sun and people have actually succeeded. So even with the warnings, you know, you knew that it was a possibility to do something incredible even in those ancient times. So for me, what I really enjoy about working at Lockheed Martin is I see the possibility become reality. The things that we think are science fiction or the things, even are things that we take for granted. GPS, anybody use GPS today? It was probably a Lockheed Martin satellite. Did anybody check the weather? A Lockheed Martin satellite. You know, these are things we saw in cartoons and comic books and movies before people were using wholesale ways to navigate and get around. Satellites going into space, going to Mars. You know, Mars, that used to be something you just saw in a movie. Now people are like, no, we're actually going to Mars. Um, one of the taglines at Lockheed Martin is the person who goes to Mars is probably in middle school right now. So could you imagine that? Um, and everything has seemed to be propelling us toward this future that we've seen on TV, but a lot of the future is already here. Um, talking about Black Panther, for example, uh, by the way, I have a massive Black Panther collection. No one can beat me. I have every Funko Pop, every action figure. I have a Black Panther Barbie, things that you can't even imagine. And as a side note, my mom has every six inch Star Trek figurine, every ship configuration. It's, it's incredible. Um, we may need to talk. We, we may need to talk. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. But the thing that made me so excited about seeing Black Panther is it's a civilization of people who understand and appreciate science. And it's part of their everyday life. It's not weird. You know, they're, they're wearing, I've got my, my smartwatch on. You know, everybody has one. <laughs> and they get one at birth, if you read the comic books. Everybody gets, you know, smart bracelet at birth. And it can communicate your health, your status. You can talk to people. Um, magnetic levitation trains, which for some reason only Japan can figure out. And hopefully one day we will too. Um, you know, hard rock mining, you know, sustainability aspects. It was just so cool to see a culture devoted to civilization. It's kind of like almost where I would imagine my parents, you know, in a fictional universe would have grown up. I love those connections because I think that um, when I've been working with objects at the museum, it's something that I really love to try to bring to the visitors at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. So I am the responsible curator, among other things, for the 11-foot studio model of the Star Trek Starship Enterprise. Um, back in the day, before computer-generated imaging, if you wanted a spaceship in your television show or in your movie, you needed to physically build one and then film it. And so this is the model that stood on a stand and they would run the camera past it. And then when you uh, edit that to put the um, star fields and the planets and things in behind it, it looks like it comes zooming across um, at you. And we were able to, in 2016, put that on exhibit in our Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall, which is our big central hall. Now, if you've been down to the museum um, this week, and I hope that if you haven't, you'd um, make that part of your Friday night or your weekend, you will see that we are massively under construction, right? We've ripped down the outside of almost half the building. Um, half of the building is closed. Uh, so the enterprise just, unfortunately, went off display while we're in the middle of this but when it was up and in that big space it was on the one side of the hall and on the other side is the lunar module that was built um, by Grumman in the 1960s to land on the moon and I love the comparison of those two vehicles because I think they're both spaceships that don't look anything like what anybody thought spaceships would look like um, it's a completely fresh imagining um, you know the um, when Matt Jeffries was coming up with the design of the Enterprise, he was by background a pilot. And so he was thinking about, he wanted the pieces of the spaceship to look like they had a purpose, right? Not just kind of some undifferentiated flying saucer or a big pointy rocket, but like there's the engine, there's the crew compartment, there's engineering, this is how you get from bit to bit. And the lunar module is in its own way designed to do everything it needed to do and not one bit more, right? Not one ounce more. So it is completely unaerodynamic because it never needs to fly in an atmosphere. This is something that was only going to fly um, on the way to the moon. 
that therefore instead of kind of metal cladding on the ra around it, it's really clad in foil. Um, and one of the, you know we get asked constantly like that's not really how it flew, right? I'm like no, that's exactly how it flew and it worked uh, absolutely every time. And um, and I love the idea that those two spacecraft were on the drawing board at the same time and were about really kind of trying to creatively break out of what have the preconceptions been and then how do we do something that's going to really have this fresh new vision. Margaret, if I could talk about just one thing about creatively uh, breaking out of what the preconceptions are yeah. and also give you a little bit of a shout out as well. So for all of you who are, are familiar with the old school Star Trek, you know who Nichelle Nichols is? Lieutenant O'Hara. So Lieutenant O'Hara was the inspiration for my mom becoming a scientist and a ton of other people. And I was fortunate enough about two years ago to introduce her at Lockheed Martin where she was speaking. One thing a lot of people may not realize about her, you know, they think they see her on TV, they saw her in conventions, and they think stars kind of just fade or maybe they do another TV series or something. She actually worked for NASA to recruit women and people of color to the space program. So when you look at NASA, especially in the older days, when you see people of color and women in the space program, she actively brought them to NASA. They didn't just show up, they didn't think they just could apply. She had to convince them, like, yes, this is for you. And she even came to Lockheed Martin um, in California and a couple of other sites to recruit people to the space program, which is why it was so exciting. And I also was able to introduce my mom to her at the conference, so I'm good for Mother's Day, for Christmas, <laughs> for birthdays, for like the next 50 years. But the reason I wanted to give a shout out to Margaret is because there are producers who are making a documentary called Woman in Motion, which is actually the name of Nichelle Nichols' company that she had after leaving Star Trek, where she went to go recruit people for NASA. And Margaret speaks in it. But you get to see the people, including former NASA administrator, you know, astronauts that you would recognize today, and maybe a couple, you know, who didn't quite have that much limelight, but there's so much change and diversity and energy she brought to the space program so that when people look at astronauts, they go, if I work hard enough, yeah, I could do that. Thank you. No problem. I think it's fascinating, the, uh, this discussion about uh, what, what spaceships and other things look like um, <laughs> and how we've imagined that in sci-fi versus what, for instance, Lockheed Martin actually builds. Um, and is, it, is, the, is the word greebling when they, when they put artificial details on the outside of spaceships just to make them look like they're a little bit more functional? Yes. Right? A, lot, a lot more uh, screws and little compartments and things like that that are just there for, you know, because of course in, in real life uh, there's going to be more functionality. I think it's interesting too to see how so much of how both science fiction and um, some of the things that we build today are really influenced by the, the actual materials, like say for instance Apollo or the you know, the foil that's on the outside of it, or the gold that reflected heat really well from the, the space helmet. A lot of those things have found their way into actual culture, and a lot has been kind of reflected on that. But as we're moving into actually building the, for the kind of everyday for space, um, there's, uh, you know, there's some requirements for safety, there's requirements in the materials that you use, so um, as we kind of move into building some of those things, we find ourselves uh, more kind of driven by the constraints than just kind of what would look fantastical, right? So when we built this, uh, this musical instrument for microgravity, it was uh, made out of a, a lot of you know, redundant bolts and, and metal and, um, and really thick um, plexiglass um, so, so that it wouldn't shatter, so that if somebody fell on it, they wouldn't be impaled by it. So there's, there's all kinds of really interesting uh, constraints that I think we'll see new aesthetics coming out um, and and probably uh, you know will inspire an, another round of, of uh, science fiction uh, beyond this so. well when you look at how science fiction affected reality you can look at your smartphone because the first smartphones were flip phones and they came directly from Star Trek they were inspired by Star Trek but nobody predicted the emergent phenomena that would come out of having these portable communication devices. Nobody could predict, for example, that most of your dating would be done by online swiping left and right. Nobody could predict that. And if you took a smartphone like you have in your pocket back to 1950, the best scientists in the world wouldn't be able to tell you either how it worked or 
what it was made out of. We simply didn't know enough about material science. So since progress is exponential, not linear, the future is going to be truly amazing. Don't expect to always use rockets. The warp drive, the impulse engines, and even stranger things will come. And they'll come because people dream before they do. Heinlein, for example, in addition to the examples I gave you, came up with an idea for how to coordinate combat information. He was an officer, a combat officer. And this was picked up by the Navy in the Second World War and evolved into the Combat Information Center in modern warships. It came from a science fiction author whose friend became an admiral. I, d I always love those connections because I think the, the creativity gets pushed in both directions, right? That you end up with the science fiction where you're really unfettered and it's anything you can draw or anything that you can imagine in words or anything that you can um, put out there and, um, you know, uh, graphic novels and comic strips are d and comic books are doing so much really interesting work. Um, you see, I would say, authors who you wouldn't have necessarily expected to be working in that genre who grew up reading those things now you know moving into that and so you get creativity moving both because it's really unfettered um, and then I think when we look at the historical analogy sometimes you see just a lot of creativity because of the constraints right so we just finished at the museum um, my colleagues were working on the conservation of Neil Armstrong's Apollo 11 spacesuit um, and when you look at the materials that are involved in that, they were innovating all over the place about kind of, um, you know, woven metals and different kinds of chemical compositions that worked beautifully in the moment and now become this real um, conservation challenge to try to think about these uh, things that worked together in the moment for functionality but that weren't ever planned as a museum object that needed to survive for 50 or 100 years. Um, but I think on both sides of the equation, then the creativity can really come from having no boundaries. And the creativity, I think, sometimes uh, comes in really interesting ways by the constraints of the actual engineering. Um, and very often, the answer to why was that thing the way it was in your television show or movie has a lot to do with it needed to be done and on the air by next week. Um, you know, so they found solutions for things. You know, the transporter comes from Star Trek lacking the budget to be able to show the spaceship going back and forth to the planet. So they decided they could dissolve the people and have them reappear. And that, you know, I think is generally when you poll people in terms of the you know technology that we most would like to have you know especially given traffic transporter is always uh, high there but a lot of times um, you know what they're trying to come up with is a creative solution for something that has a lot of constraints on it well i can tell you that a u.s patent just issued about three weeks ago on a quantum momentum transfer apparatus that, if the theory works correctly, will generate about 27 to 47,000 newtons per square meter and won't use any fuel. That's a patent that's issued, and that's an, uh, exactly what you're talking about. I think there's, there are all kinds of interesting things happening in the engineering space, but I think how we engineer humans it, has been a theme throughout a lot of uh, science fiction um, and this the sense that we might actually be able to kind of evolve um, in this what they call volitional evolution right that we decide how we how we evolve uh, and uh, there's a lot of interesting sci-fi and also experiments happening um, that are not only about the kind of architectures that we find ourselves in in space but actually how how we will become new types of humans um, and I think that's that's fascinating and we're just kind of getting to these details of like what, what happens to the human uh, when they spend long enough in space. Um, so one of the projects that we have at the Media Lab is called Space Human, uh, which is gonna, um, a, adding a tail to the human. 
uh, and, and asking, uh, you know, if you, if you need both of your hands and you need to also be stabilized at the same time, uh, can we just add an appendage to some degree? Um, which is more of a prosthetic than, than kind of evolving the human, but it gets at this kind of, this need to grapple with a new type of environment. Um, and I think there's just endless, endlessly fascinating experiments to be done uh, in terms of kind of how we live in that environment. And there's also research being done even about how we will kind of intrinsically become different humans. So this great research paper um, that looks at how the gravitational orientation um, actually has uh, an impact on our aesthetic preferences. So they've done research search that shows that when you're kind of aligned with gravitational line, just like we all are sitting in our seats right now, um, you prefer uh, certain things. So we're, statistically, we like things that have more vertical and horizontal lines in them, but they tested people that were actually kind of off of that line of gravitation uh, and realized that they, they have statistically different aesthetic preferences. So I'm, I'm fascinated to see where that research goes. It's not very well understood yet, but clearly there are things about us that, that have a lot more to do with gravity than we ever realized. Um, and, and we're just kind of at the cusp of understanding where we're, where we're going to go. I was just on a panel on Wednesday on space architecture, um, past ideas and future, and one of the things that kind of kept coming up is the ways that um, everything that we've sent into space has been designed on the ground. And so even when you had really creative people, um, so for instance, for the Skylab, NASA hired Raymond Lowy, who was an industrial designer who had worked on uh, Pennsylvania Railroad, Coca-Cola, uh, to really start thinking through the interior of the Skylab uh, space laboratory. And they were very interested in habitability, right? How do we move from something with, this was a crash program where it's just about survivability, we need to be able to get to space, get to the moon and back. We're now going four weeks at a time. What's it going to be like to live there? And one of the things he designed was a kind of three-part table that would allow the crew to have like a nice meal sitting around together very equitably. He was very concerned with the sense of uh, hierarchy. And um, so it has magnets that would allow you to kind of put your little cans of food into a nice little ta tray. Um, but it involves then strapping yourself into a seat so that you sit around this thing. And the first, you know, Sandy Magnus, uh, astronaut, was on the panel. She's like, you don't need seats in space, right? That's the last thing, you know, that's a complete waste. You don't need that at all. Um, and it was really interesting then to look back at even these kind of uh, really revolutionary designs that you saw, say, in the Collier's Magazine series in the 1950s, imagining these giant orbital space stations that would look like Bernal spheres or that would be, um, you know, uh, like a giant bicycle wheel or things like that. And we tend to nonetheless divide those spaces in the imagination into these very rectangular rooms that have nice flat floors um, and orient all the stuff to the floor. So one of the challenges that really came out of that discussion was what would it really look like to design something with a zero G or microgravity mindset? You know, of how do you really use the space? Um, you know, uh, Sandy Magnus would point out, you know, we're wasting a tremendous amount of volume in this wonderful space by all being only on the floor. And yet that, you know, something this big in space is useless because you need to be able to push off and touch things and having this much emptiness would really be counterproductive. Um, so just thinking about the ways that it requires us to change our mindset, to um, glean some of the insights that have come from people's spaceflight experience and from what's going on. So, so we are very excited today, um, in addition to our um, conversation with our panelists, to be able to have an announcement uh, from the Heinlein Foundation and Trust. Art, would you like to take it away? Yes, and I'll be, I'll be brief so as not to interrupt the program very much, but uh, Mr. Heinlein had a very successful career as a writer. He uh, won numerous Hugos. He was the first science fiction grandmaster, and he published amazing works. After he died in 1988, his wife, Virginia, set up a foundation, a 501c3 charity, to carry on his ideas. This is the Heinlein Prize Trust, which gives a 
quarter of a million dollar prize for accomplishments in commercial space activities. We've given it three times to Peter Diamandis for Spaceship One, to Elon Musk for Falcon One, and to Jeff Bezos for the BE series of engines. All of these are commercial. All of them have the potential to make profit, and we're trying to realize the vision of Virginia and Robert Heinlein. In the years when we don't give the prize, and we can give it every year, we're looking for someone to give it to now. We do other things like showing spacesuits. And we have in this show, in booth 295, we have Peggy Winston, the head of the US astronaut office. We have her actual spacesuit that flew the International Space Station. You're welcome to come down and touch it and put on a glove and pretend you're an astronaut. No, you know that bothers me, Art. Hmm? You know that bothers me. You're letting people touch artifacts. <laughs> yes, but fortunately, we own the spacesuit. Uh, the, uh, uh, I'd like to tell you that we have another animal. This is a mother thing from Heinlein's book, Have Spacesuit Will Travel. And uh, the mother thing is assigned to protect Peggy's spacesuit from bad influences. In Heinlein's estate, we found a manuscript. And this manuscript was the book he wanted to publish as The Number of the Beast, but he could not because the story, or three quarters of it, is set in two other authors' universes, E. e. Smith's Lensman universe and Edgar Rice Burroughs' Barsoom, Mars. And I'm pleased to announce today that the Ark Manor Publishing Company, would you put up the other slide, please? is going to publish on, I believe, the 24th of March, the last Heinlein novel. It'll be several hundred pages long. It's a cracking good novel. And we have this, uh, this little teaser sitting in the back of the hall. And this is the official announcement of its publication. So I hope that we'll have at least one more Heinlein book. And who knows, it might win a Hugo. Thank you. The publisher, by the way, is sitting in the front row if you have any questions after the program. Thank you very much. And I know that you have said that if uh, Peggy Whitson's suit disintegrates from a million touches, but touches then a million different lives and gets them to imagine spaceflight, that you will have considered that well used. And I it find will that hard have to been expended with. in service if the children of Washington, D.C. today come to this public day and they touch it. We'll clean it afterwards, it's not a problem. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, I, before I thank our panelists, I wanna uh, open the floor to our audience um, and give people a chance to ask questions. Um, do, I don't know if we have uh, microphones. We have a microphone coming from the back. Um, and so I see a hand up in the middle here. Let's get her first and then we will, uh, and I, I think, Given the size of the space, I'm going to repeat the question anyway. Hello, I am Chile. I work with Ariel as well. I am MIT's Media Lab Space Futurist for the Space Initiative. And I had a question. What do you think, well, no. Do you think the spaceships of the 21st century, uh, specifically the latter part, would look like the ships on Star Trek? And um, a anyone can answer this. Thank that you. would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd certainly be there for the first launch if I could. But I would imagine in terms of, you know, dynamics, it's not the most efficient design. Um, there's a reason why there are rockets. These spaceships tend to be like rockets um, because of the propulsion. Um, if we have better technology, I could see maybe, I don't know if anybody watched The Watchmen on HBO. That's also a graphic novel um, I watched before. Okay, so nobody watched The Watchmen on HBO last weekend. Nobody. All right, so there's this character called the Night Owl and he makes a spaceship or a ship that's round and it kind of looks like the face of an owl, like two big eyes sticking out. I kind of always imagine spaceships eventually looking like that, like a big kind of round circular thing 
it kind of just floats up instead of just thrusts off. But I don't know. It could be anything, um, really. Well, actually, I have an opinion as an attorney and a businessman, not as a technologist. I believe that a spaceship exactly like NCC-1701, right down to its hall number, will be built and operated, if nothing else, as a cruise ship for tourists. <laughs> and I believe it will use drives that we have not invented yet. I doubt if it will be the main thing, but we still go on sailing ships, don't we? Seriously. Very true. And I would go on that cruise. It would be fun. And they'd have to perfect it a little bit for me. <laughs> so maybe like the 112th cruise I would go on. <laughs> they get L cars right, then I'll be yes. on board. <laughs> One of the things that, you know, the imagination of that, of a very different vision of uh, engineering a spaceship often comes from the idea that you would be assembling um, in orbit, right? That once you, if you can get the mass from someplace else, one of the things that I did in uh, preparation for this panel and also for um, the space architecture panel was spent some time in the papers of Gerard O'Neill, uh, who was a Princeton physicist in the 1970s who put his physics class, um, put to them the question of, you know, where is the best place? If we're not going to live on this planet, where would the best place be for humanity? And they started to he thought this would be a thought experiment, and they th started to run the numbers on what would it take, you know, if you could really use, and he was very uh, optimistic about the capacity of the new sp uh, coming space shuttle to really get people, material, um, and material off of the Earth or from the moon, then what could you construct? Um, and got very excited about the idea when his students started to bring him back the numbers that they seemed to actually work. Um, and so the L5 Society with the idea of creating these space stations that wouldn't orbit, that would basically sit at these um, moment spaces of gravitational equilibrium Lagrange points, that that L5 comes from that fifth Lagrange point, that that's uh, something that the people worldwide got very excited about, you know, maybe that could someday be the future, but so, um, that was really connected the next generation vision of what the spacecraft could look like, what the space station could look like was then connected in many ways to that capacity to lift quite so much stuff and, and quickly, repeatedly. Um, and I think that infrastructure is still something that both NASA, other uh, countries, space agencies, and industry are really working on what, how are the ways that we make this more regular in a broader set of applications in addition to the satellite world that we live in and amongst that we don't even think about anymore. If you think about, you know, 1957, Sputnik goes up, it's the first thing ever. And now we just rely on this constellation around our planet that tells us where to get a coffee or what exit we need or what the weather's going to be. Um, it's really uh, a remarkable thing. But um, I think that some of the changes may come from being able to expand that infrastructure to be as reliable as we've come to rely on our satellite infrastructure to be. And if you go to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, Please which do. I advise you to do, you can see the last piece of Sputnik that still exists. They, it is on display to the public. Well, I'm thinking of going right now, so should I go? Oh, please. It's, uh, we're half closed, the building is half closed, and the half that we have is still very worth seeing, um, and we are going to be completely revitalized and transformed on the other side of all of this work. Thank you so much. And Thank it's you. free. And it's free. If you're yes. not from here, all the Smithsonian museums are free, and the zoo. I meant to mention earlier, and I apologize, I actually have to give uh, another talk on the musical instruments we've designed for microgravity, so I will gracefully exit stage left here and, and let you finish up the conversation. But I did want to mention one thing, which is that there's a lot of uh, speculative design that goes on that kind of straddles this line of science fiction and actual engineering. So I would point you to Norman Belgeds and some of his really early designs of, of really, really huge, almost kind of like cruise liner uh, airships that he was designing, and I, I believe that the architecture of them just 
couldn't, literally couldn't fly uh, in what he imagined, but there are uh, some really beautiful models that he created early on. Um, so that, yeah, there's some really interesting kind of speculation about things that maybe material science will catch up with at some point and we'll see these different kind of forms that we can only imagine at the moment. Sans, um, since you will have to leave and I have no stuff about the Media Lab, would you like a backup to your backup? <laughs> I think we'll let them finish the conversation because we have a very small amount of time left in the uh, Q&A. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you very thank you much to Sans Fish to of the MIT Media Lab uh, for participating today. And he does need to get to the other side of the convention center, so we really should have given him about 45 minutes. But um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Up front on the, your left. Thank you so much. This has been really inspiring. Um, we've been doing a lot of research on how sci-fi has influenced what we have today. And we're still talking about the stuff that we've dreamed about back in the 50s and, and before. Um, I'm wondering how you all feel about the current state of science fiction and where we're headed in the future. Well, I will say as someone who kind of follows science fiction professionally, I think it's really exciting. I think there um, is something that I would have said 10 to 15 years ago. I think science fiction kind of ebbs and flows um, and then gets these wonderful new reinvigorations of uh, creative talent. Um, and I think that what you're seeing in some of the, um, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, Lost in Space, people kind of recreating and reimagining these older properties and then taking them in these creative new directions. Um, I think that um, there is some really compelling new writing. There's apparently compelling new writing even from uh, Robert Heinlein. Um, so we're going to get to have a, a new... Uh, novel added to the compendium that we know and love so well. Um, but I, as I said at the beginning, I just started reading um, Nnedi Okorafor's um, Binti series, uh, which is a series of three novellas and um, uh, a, a, from a Nigerian-American author imagining um, a young woman leaving her people to go off to uh, university and um, in a, uh, on an interstellar spaceship. And um, it's just uh, creative in this way that I think um, just feels like a breath of fresh air when you're reading it. And so um, some of these, I think, really fresh voices coming into the conversation are taking us in, in really new directions. One thing I will say is I like that science fiction these days is not so cartoonish as it used to be in the old days, things aren't as black and white, people have moral dilemmas, you see the consequences to their actions, whether it's bringing back a new alien life form or not equally distributing the power dynamics in the ship. I'm thinking of Stargate, for example, you know, where there's a coup, if you watch Stargate, um, or you know, even Venom, you, know, you bring back an alien life form and there you have this thing that eats people. You know, like, did anybody not think about this, you know? And so, and sometimes when I see scientists building certain things or doing things I've seen in movies, um, like AI, I'm like, I've seen this movie. I know how it ends. It doesn't end well. And, you know, maybe the AI won't take over the world and Skynet won't control all of us and then we're in a fight um, for the future with Arnold Schwarzenegger. But I like how you see the consequences of the dynamics and there's less of these stereotypes and archetypes like the bold male captain with the really good haircut and clean shaven even when he's been out in the wilderness for two weeks with no razor. You know, and you know, the sex spot female who comes around and sometimes she's green, sometimes she's pink, sometimes she's human with ridiculous clothes. To be fair, she still exists. But it's getting a little bit better. Sometimes the lead is the small little weird alien guy that nobody really pays attention to or characters have personalities and attitudes, you know, and they won't be sidelined. Sometimes even the robots talk trash. And I kind of like that where you see the possibility of so many different interpersonal dynamics, but also the consequences of using technology and decision making. Each generation brings forth its own writers and its own visualizers. It's clear that you can't write science fiction now without having knowledge, you have to take and satisfy an audience that's technically literate and that a movie like The Martian, for example, it's very accurate technically. And some of the books, you have to be 
technically accurate. But you still have wonderful new writers like John Scalazzi, who, who wrote Old Man's War. You know, you get to be 75 years old, and you go report to the army, and they give you a new body and send you out to an interstellar war. And uh, he wrote a book called Heads Off, where the football players work dynamically through robots, and it's called Heads Off because you score by knocking the other side's head off. Now, this is imagination coupled with technology. And as the technology changes and as the social values change, we have a lot to look forward to from these new authors. Like you were mentioning this Nigerian-American author. that I'm going to go read him after you. I, I haven't read him yet. But there's a wonderful Chinese author that uh, I'm trying to remember his name. Uh, uh, he, he wrote about the moving the entire earth, the moving earth to get it away from the sun that was going to explode. And he's marvelous. The People's Republic of China. I have a quick follow-up question to that. Yeah. Um, in our research, we found that people like Ray Bradbury, for example, and Arthur C. Clarke, I believe, was a part of panels at JPL and Caltech, always there to inform and re-inspire the people that were working day to day on the actual science and engineering side. Is that still happening today that you know of? Oh, I think very much so. Um, I think when you look into the history of science fiction, um, the folks who are creating those visualizations are often very much reading the technical journals to make sure that they're up to date. I know, you know, Matt Jeffries uh, was looking actively, it was very important that the enterprise not accidentally look like something that was then going to actually roll off the line uh, at some major aerospace company, you know, five, ten years down the line, and make them look not futuristic but um, but current. And um, so I think that there's often a lot of uh, crossover, and the folks who are writing and creating science fiction are often some really reading the technical journals to get a sense of kind of what's being discovered and how can I extrapolate that or you know, defamiliarize that, take that to the next step. And I will add, um, for instance, Hidden Figures, part of that was filmed at Lock one of Lockheed Martin's facilities and at Astra as well. And the director came by and had conversations with the scientists. So when they're making these movies, they're talking to the people. And they're not just going to panels, they're actually going to the workshops, the facilities, the labs. And they're talking to the scientists and the creators and the engineers to make sure things make sense. Um, but as Margaret said, to make sure they're not accidentally copying a top secret design, you know, and giving us away to the Russians mm -hmm. um, or, you know, any other competitive um, companies or countries. Thank you. I actually meant it the other way around. Like Ray, Ray Bradbury would be invited to JPL and Caltech to inspire the engineers to remind them what they're shooting for, to put bones to the dream, as Ray Bradbury said. Well, we had Nichelle Nichols, um, as I mentioned earlier, Lieutenant O'Hora from Star Trek, who came through um, Lockheed Martin a couple of years ago. And I've never seen so many scientists melt in one place, or engineers. And so many people are like, oh, I became a scientist or an engineer because I saw you on TV. Or you were the only show my parents would let me stay up to watch when I was younger. So um, we do invite people like that to come. We've even had a graphic artist who draws from Marvel and DC to talk about his creative process and how he interprets technology especially when he's drawing something like Wakanda for Black Panther, and the inspiration he gets from scientists, but also the inspiration they get from him as well. And I think the piece that we opened with from J.J. Abrams is an illustration of that, of you know, bringing that voice into that conversation at MIT. I think we have time for one more, if we have one more right up in the front. Uh, first, let me uh, thank all of you. It's been an incredible discussion, so thank you very much. Uh, my name is Raheem Mohammed, and for the past 25 years, I've operated a 501c nonprofit. Uh, primarily, our focus is art and culture, uh, but we do have a STEM component, and we refer to ours as STEMAC, uh, STEM plus art plus culture. Uh, this past summer in our camp, we turned our studio about 800 square feet into the bridge of a starship, uh, like on Star Trek. Uh, computers set up, screens, uh, projectors, and it worked out very well. We also toured 
all of the uh, space museums in the area. We went to Air and Space, we went to Udvahazi, we went to Goddard Space Center, and uh, we also had some people from NASA come by and speak to our students. Um, my question is pretty much to you, Ms. Uh, Mikkel. Uh, what does uh, Lockheed Martin do uh, to support artists and also to support uh, STEM programs? So one of our major streams of philanthropy is STEM education. So we do a ton of things for STEM education and we have a whole website devoted to that. If I were to tell you, we'd be here all day. But let me do this. Um, afterwards, I'll give you my card. If you have any questions, I'll be sure to direct you to the right place. But we need scientists, we need engineers, we need thinkers, we need dreamers, we need builders. And we are happy to work with anyone who is going to help us move forward with the future. That's great. I thank think that's a much. wonderful final word for our panel. Um, thank you very much, Mikkel. Thank you very much, Art. Uh, thanks in absentia to, uh, to Sands. And, uh, and thank you all for coming and taking the time to spend with us today.